the 25th. I have other instructions. <laughs> Annual Live Fever Winter Series on Aging. And I'm your host, Elena Volpi. And uh, the Silly Center on Aging, which I direct, uh, sponsors this series of five lectures, which start tonight, um, that traditionally start on the last Tuesday of the month of January and uh, spread out throughout the month of February, till the end of February. Um, we, we, the lecture series features national and internationally renowned speakers who focus on topics relevant to aging and geriatrics. And this lecture series is in honor of uh, and, and the memory of Dr. Edward James Lefevre. He was a physician who began uh, providing medical care for the citizens of Galveston Island in, the ni in 1939. Um, he also taught internal medicine at UTMB. And over time, he became interested in geriatrics because he saw that many of his uh, colleagues felt uncomfortable taking care of older people. And so he started to preferentially take on uh, seniors as his patients. And, uh, and essentially, he became the Galveston Island geriatrician. Um, he became the director of Turner's and Moody's House, which is now the Meridian Retirement Community. And right before he died, the Division of Geriatrics was uh, um, started at UTMB and was developed. And after his death, his family and friends endowed this lecture series in the Silly Center on Aging um, to honor his memory. So tonight's uh, speaker uh, is going to be introduced by Dr. James Goodwin, who is the founding director of the Silly Center on Aging, and he actually established this lecture series. Jim? With my own hands, I established it. Um, <laughs> it was really heroic. Um, but that's probably the third lecture. So, so we're real happy to have John uh, Schuster um, down here uh, to talk about uh, asset-based aging. I met uh, John uh, last year about this time at Camp Allen, which is a uh, Closer? <laughs> oh, I'm the one who gives directions. Here. So um, uh, we met at Camp Allen last year, uh, where John uh, uh, gave a, a lecture on humor, which it would be really good if he gave again. But he's not, OK? <laughs> um, and um, so first off, he's a really nice guy. Um, and fun to be with and, and, and a good speaker. He's been a, uh, a career coach, I guess you call an executive coach, uh, for most of his career. He's written uh, uh, many books about it. Uh, he lists several on his su uh, summary statement, but he also has others. Um, and he and his wife together have a business uh, uh, in Ohio, Kansas City, and now in, uh, I guess, Columbus, Ohio. Um, uh, that does career coaching. He's become more and more interested as he goes along, as we all do, in aging. Um, and, uh, and so he's been concentrating more and written more uh, about uh, sort of uh, fulfilling uh, um, fulfillment uh, in, in older age and growth uh, in older age. And so um, we uh, welcome John uh, to talk tonight. Thank you so much. Whoops, I should turn on my mic. We're having this mic challenge up here. And uh, until I get introduced at these speeches, I forget how renowned I am. <laughs> now I'm feeling renowned, and it's wonderful. Uh, but we, I do know this lecture series is, is quite the place. It's been uh, great to learn about the Sealy Center, and, and it's a real honor to be here. And you know, speak, speakers are supposed to say that, you know, it's rapport building and all that. But this one actually means it. Um, and I mean that because I don't get that many opportunities to be at a place where the science is being done. So thank you, two of you, and to all of the staff here for the wonderful uh, vision that uh, was started and the vision that's being lived now 
on behalf of the quality of life of all of us. And I say us because I'm now uh, 71, and so I qualify for sure. Uh, and but all those young faces there, uh, you know, someday. And and uh, so for all of us, I really mean that on behalf of humanity. It's wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. So with that said, um, I want to kind of get right into what we're going to be talking about. And and the uh, there's many I could I could do a little bit of background things before that. So the reason I ended up talking about this is I was doing a lot of programming for 50 year olds in corporations who had done a great career run and then stalled and were just tired of the intensity and the fatigue of that uh, of that of their work. And uh, do the math with me here. There was a 45-year-old uh, dentist talking about this, not in the corporate world, but talking about career fatigue at midlife. And he said, uh, do the math with me. He said, uh, I'm 45 now. 28 years ago, a 17-year-old boy decided I was going to be a dentist. Did we get the math there? Right? And so we make these runs with our imagination, with our will. We push ourselves into these careers to go out and make a difference and to make a living for our families and, and then to create families, of course. But uh, somewhere along the way, it can get stale. And it used to be when, when lives were shorter that maybe one good run would do it. But now we <laughs> live so darn long, right? And so it's no longer icing on the cake to retire at age 65 and then say, OK, I got a little bit, couple years here, but I just kind of enjoy this and kick back. Instead, we got 25 more years, and, and where did all these years come from? And I've got to reimagine my future now. And so that's the 50-year-olds. I will do that for, for them. We kind of help them renew their, their, their commitment to work and to their other values, which almost always includes family and community and then profession. And then we'll do a program for 60-year-olds who are heading towards retirement. So they have ten, that 10 years makes a huge difference. And uh, both of those times when we do these programs, there's, a, there's an important line that I'll, I'll suggest we think about here at the beginning, which is uh, something that there's multiple answers to. But listen to this great sentence that came from one of my mentors some years ago. He was the first person who I ever heard the phrase, second half of life. I remember being 39 years old, and someone said, second half of life. And I said, say what? <laughs> and sure enough, it had never occurred to me because I had been so busy with the first half that the second half had to be. And he says, he said this, he said, the quality of your life is determined by, now there's probably lots of good answers to that question, right? It's determined by, so what would be some, some good answers to that question? Your health. Your health, yeah. Awesome. What's another one? Your relationships. Your relationships, big. What's another one? Your attitude. Your attitude. That's, yeah, it's big, big. How, how do you choose your attitudes? Your passions. Your passions. Your, uh, you know, and so you, the, your decisions. You know, what decisions have you made? You know, and your value. You know, there's a lot of good answers, but this is what the answer he would supply. He would say the quality of your life is determined by the quality of your inner dialogue. The quality of your inner Are you talking sense to yourself? Right? Isn't that interesting? Because if you ever find yourself having a problem, and you go, well, darn, I can't, no, that's not going to work. Oh, no, that's not going to work. Well, I'm stuck over here. And, you know, you're stuck. And then you go tell a friend about it, and they don't say much. They just listen, but you come up with three more ideas, and you say, oh, thanks. That was wonderful what you just did. Well, they didn't do a thing. All you did was get some more imaginative uh, release of, of some other possibilities. But now the quality of your inner dialogue has just been enriched uh, maybe by a lot, not just by a little. You've got options you've never known you had. And so this little title here called Asset-Based Aging, you can tell where this is going. This is a positive run at what's it mean to be getting older and what are the, what are the possibilities here. And so we're going to use a, a financial metaphor, assets equals liabilities plus net worth. Those of you, any MBAs in the group, any accountants? All right, we have a couple of accountants. That's great. All right, all right. Good. <laughs> Just a listener, all right. Well, this is a financial metaphor that, of course, you can't get away from business now in, in, the, in the United States just because there's business in news everywhere. But back when I was in school, that wasn't happening. But here's the basic formula that you, you should know about life. And people don't have these financial 
algorithms. They're real simple, but if you don't have them, the world doesn't make financial sense. One of them is revenue minus expenses equals profit or loss. That's an important one. And there's one on cash flow as well. But the balance sheet's important, which is your relative net worth. So assets equals, if you do the algebra with it, liabilities plus net worth. And here's what happened about, what, 12 years ago? Remember the financial crisis? Those young faces back there may not, but there was a big financial crisis when property values went choop like that. So liability would be a mortgage, right? That stayed the same. That would be big. Asset value just shrunk. So now assets equals liabilities, liability being bigger than the asset, you had negative net worth. People didn't know what that meant, so, but what they say, what, they didn't know the formula, but they knew they were upside down. They'd say, I'm upside down on my mortgage. I now owe more on my mortgage than I do in the value in my house. Those of you who are negative net worth some things in the back of the room because you've been borrowing to go to school, hi, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> nice to meet all you negative net worthers. Yes. It's a common lot in life. We, you can just, the good news is it will only take you 50 years to work out. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, but it's, it's how we start. And I don't know any family that wants to say, you know what I want to do? I want to lessen my net worth. That's really my goal in my life. Is no, it's the way we work in a capitalist society is we have to increase, increase it. So basically, this is a way of saying when we look at aging, assets equals liabilities for net worth plus net worth, we know that. The we know a lot about the liabilities. Let's talk about the assets. What's on the positive side of the ledger? So it's my run to do that. Uh, I think there's some good, uh, good reports on this. Uh, some of this is going to be rather poetic and metaphoric rather than scientific. Sorry about that. You're looking at someone who has a heavy right brain influence in his life and who was an English major. Himself. But just like all of us in the United States can't avoid financial information, and it's good for us to know that, nor can people like me uh, ignore scientific information. So the neurosciences are actually somewhat on our side, at least I'll present it in my very amateurish way. Please, those of you who are smart about this stuff, uh, cut me some slack today. I will be uh, putting out my very amateurish way of talking about uh, science. But um, uh, you'll see how I take a run at that, and then you can correct me later, OK, in emails and send me send me journal articles and say how, uh, how wrong I was. Um, it's so interesting right now. Every speaker, now every, anybody who speaks is, is the neuroscience supports blah, 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 you know, whatever, whatever you want to have supported. You go find some article somewhere or some little paragraph. <laughs> and you, you quote it as if it means something. So, <clears throat> so that's a little bit about my background here. Let's, uh, let's begin with the, some of the content here, which is largely gathered. How many of you have the handout? You have the handout that we gave? A lot of people have that? OK, good. There's some reading in here. I don't always do reading. There's a couple people up here, I think, who need to want that handout. Do we have any more handouts? Yeah. Yeah, let's see. Raise your hand if you don't have one. We'll get you one. Good, all right. Yeah, there's one over there, a couple up here. Good. And uh, I don't always do, um, do this. Sometimes uh, I resort to humor and jokes throughout the entire time. But uh, we'll, we will have fun time today. But I, will, I, I do want us to read some of the words of some people that I think make a difference here in what we're talking about in terms of asset-based aging. So here's what I intend to talk about in the time here. Aging worth is about development, uh, is the first thing I want to read about. So what do, what do I mean by development? Uh, uh, Jim mentioned it when he said, it's about growth. What's the growth that we can go through? And so the handout I want you to read with me is, read the piece that says uh, Sam Atkins. It's towards the top there, Sam Atkins quoted by Betty Friedan in Fountain of Age. Uh, and he wrote this at age 92. He's writing on rigidity. And he says, Certain, certainly medical belief and psychoanalytic assumptions have until recently characterized the old person as rigid. I believe that in the need for adaptation, a fundamental reorganization of my psychic aberration apparatus has taken place, and that this is true for most, if not all, people. Now, that's a speculation. Had he done science with that? Had he researched that? No. But he's 92 years old, so at least we have an end of one, right? And I'm, I'm another one, so there's two. So <laughs> and I'm 20 years, 21 years in junior. But is this simply a matter of disease and illness, or have I undergone some developmental transformation? That's his question to himself. He wrote this uh, at age 92, back in the 90s, I believe. Could have written it in the 80s. 
Forced to relinquish many preoccupations and functions and ambitions, one gains an opportunity to see things in a fresh way, things that were hidden, pushed aside by the pressure of getting and spending. Now that's his hypothesis. Did he get to prove it? No. Unfortunately, uh, this is still unproven largely, and it may stay this way for a long time. I don't know if it will remain a mystery or a speculation or not, but I'm here to tell you that this is where I'm placing my bets. I'm placing my bets on that, that there's a lot of positives. There's assets that we can harvest here, or at least pay attention to, that uh, might be missed. And it's that attitude thing, the convention you it's that attitude thing about how the individual can make a big difference here in terms of choosing what their development, uh, what, what their development is about. So thank you, uh, thank you, Sam Atkins, for putting that out there uh, as kind of a beginning piece. So there's the intro. I've talked about the assets already. I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of science. Uh, I'll have to explain that in just a bit. But basically, uh, uh, Jim and I were talking about this in our first meeting today, which was, I am both the subject and the object here, so, right? So I'm, I'm studying me, and I'm doing it as the subject studying. So, you know, it's, so how do you do that? Well, all psychology is that, you know, where we're hemmed in by our own consciousness. Our consciousness has its limits. So how do you figure, how do you do that? Well, I'll give it a run, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk a little bit about ageism and the reframing that's being done with that. Largely, a place like this is... Uh, the Sealy Center is a place for wonderful reframing, where we look at the possibilities, health-wise and others. Uh, is it true uh, uh, that the, the, per the first person who's going to live to be 140 is already on the planet? Is that probably pretty proven, right? I mean, just it's probably going to happen, right? So congratulations for all of us, again, for pushing the boundaries of whatever's going to happen to us physically. You already have. You know, it's just long lives that we have. So. So the reframe is starting, it's at every level, physical, emotional, psychological. I'm going to add the spiritual dimension for me because it's a big part. Then I'll talk about the, the liabilities, the suffering and decline. We, we know about that. I'll spend less time on that today, but I have to mention that. I can't pretend, oh, every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Uh, I've been around people who are disgustingly positive and pretending, <laughs> you know, give me a break, you know, where's your where's, you got to be realistic about this, you know. But, but that's that's when the attitude goes sour, right? And we don't uh, we romanticize and sentimentalize and pretend. So we have to talk about this dimension, or we're truly, truly unrealistic about it. And um, and then I'm going to say net worth. This is my accounting formula. I'm going to try to conclude a little bit about what I think that if we take the assets and we minus the liabilities, do we have a plus or a minus? You have a plus or minus, and I think there's a large element of good fortune and luck in here, is there not? None of us know what's going to happen to us physically as we go. And I have a 75-year-old sister right now with Alzheimer's, and she's got a big liability. And uh, uh, um, well, I'll see her in a, in a week or two, and uh, I'm, watching, I'm watching her deal with that uh, in a way that who knows what, what her inner experience of that is. Because ultimately, she can't report on her inner experience very well, I think. That becomes part of the limitation. Um, Patricia, my wife, uh, just lost a sister, a 71-year-old sister my age, of glioblastoma. and was gone in about 10 months. And so we saw, we went through that experience with her <coughs> last year. I would say my wife was the ace uh, caregiver and family support person that could possibly happen, and one of the best grievers I know. She knows how to grieve and grieve well and, and celebrate all at the same time. It's quite extraordinary. Since I'm talking about her, I might as well introduce you to her. Patricia Kane, would you please stand up? <laughs> he had the emotional intelligence PhD in the family without the formal designation. All right, so, so I go to her for a lot of my guidance. So this is what we're going to try to get through today, and I guarantee you we'll get through some of it. And then fun is allowed to some degree. Is this okay, Jim? Fun. All right. So I think I think we should do our first fun thing, because this is. Uh, notice how I wove this in here, just so the tr to transition. I work on transitions all the time, and this was just a way of saying, okay, I'm going to tell some jokes now. All right. So, and I'm probably going to have to tell you my Aunt Dorothy's joke. My 95-year-old beautiful Aunt Dorothy died uh, about uh, four days ago. And so it's a, I feel myself getting a little sad about Dorothy leaving us, but what a great legacy she left. And she was the family humorist. 
And so uh, uh, I'll have to tell you at least one of her jokes. She, she was always a little off color, so I'll get you a little on the edge of your seat when I end uh, up. You can't do that in a public way. Well, you're right, I can't, but I might do just a little. Okay, so. so are you ready for these? These are high, these are high quality jokes. Are you ready? Did you hear about the two pretzels who walked down the road? One of them was assaulted. <laughs> they, they get better. Okay, knock, knock. A little old lady. Oh, I didn't know you could yodel. No, no, these are some of the best ones. Right. Knock, knock. Cash. Yeah, no thanks, I have some peanuts. <laughs> oh. And our last knock knock joke of the day for those of you who are suffering right now. Uh, knock knock. Yeah. Razor. Razor. Uh, razor hands. This is a stick up. Oh. <laughs> so be prepared for more fun interludes because this, this is a cheap, cheap endorphin uh, expanding uh, trick I'm using, and I hope it works a little bit. So, all right. And I just set down my little pointer, and but that's all right. We'll just use the button or something. Anybody see where I put the pointer? This is always, this is, oh, here it is up here. Right. These are the kind of things that when I was 50, I know it never happened. I was shocked. I was quick. I was young. <laughs> now I'm 71 and I'm fumbling around and I'm hoping my zipper is not down. <laughs> and that's between me and Patricia to talk about because about age 65, I developed a new habit, which was I'd come out of the bathroom without my zipper being up. <laughs> and I was the most embarrassing darn thing. I think. And I still can't change that habit. So, but that's called TMI, too much information. So, sorry about that. All right, sorry about that. All right, really, really bad about that. See, I have these spontaneous moments where I'm out of control, and these are, these are always a danger. I want to read to you a little bit about the asset. Now, see the, see the, ne the next handout down there from Jungian analyst, Florida Maxwell Scott. The Measure of My Day, written in 1968. She wrote this at the age of 83. This one writer in, in this little book, this little small volume, captures it all. She captures the assets, she deeply captures the liabilities, and she tries to make a final judgment. It's a beautiful, beautiful, little poetic book. Here's how she writes about it. And she's studying herself, of course. This is one of these 83-year-old studies. We who are old know that age is more than a disability. It is an intense and varied experience, almost beyond our capacity at times, but something to be carried high. It is, uh, if it is a long defeat, it is also a victory, meaningful for the initiates of time, if not for those who have come less far. So that little phrase, remember English major here, initiates of time. And so now when I look at my elder friends, when I see how long they've been on their path, and I look in their eyes and I see there's something that gets shared between elders that's this unspoken language of we're somehow initiated by time. And uh, uh, she, she, she grabs it as, an, as, as that asset. So it's, 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 it's intimate and varied, she said. It's intense and varied. It is a defeat, but it's also somehow a victory. Well, what, 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 what's the victory is what I want to know about, and, and we'll talk a little bit about maybe how, how that works. So here's a, here's a couple more thoughts for you. Uh, first of all, isn't that the greatest image of a season of a life, right? Springtime, summer, autumn, and then winter. And yet, in the lower right-hand corner, is the tree still alive and doing something that's important in winter? Yeah. yeah. You'd have to say so. So that image for me captures so much about the beauty of what this, what what our what our lives are about. And. I'm going to talk about a couple of strategies to successfully negotiate the aging process. One is carry forth midlife as long as you can for success, like the 93-year-old water skier, right? And this is what the, the uh, oh, we were talking a little bit about that, uh, Raphael, today, weren't we? I think, yeah, we were talking about, uh, and several of you brought up these experience, the 79-year-old triathlete and the, you know, and so we do, and so, congr and, and we should do that as much as we can. I carry tennis forward as long as I can. I'm still playing tennis, but not like I used to. And I had too many injuries, so I'm going to use the other, the other, uh, I may be going to pickleball before long here. And that's because I'm using um, 
uh, these the, the substitute strategy. So there's carry it forward and there's substitute it. Those are two very practical things to talk about. And at places like Camp Allen at the Abundant Living Conference, we, we share a lot of that. Um, this, oh, excuse me, that's not what that other, I, I just got ahead of myself. I talked about substitute strategies. The other strategy is this. This is where the asset comes in, and I, I want you to, to think about this. When I'm working with aging people and they're in their 70s and 80s and they're working on this, I'll, I'll, you know, they know they can't do some things as well as they used to. And that feels like a deficit. Oh, woe is me. Uh, uh, and, and it's, but it's all woe. It's all a decline. Eventually, it, you know, but it's not all a decline. So the question that Patricia and I have gotten used to asking people in this process is, what can you do better now than you could when you were younger? Or what can you do only now? And I've had plenty of 40-somethings and 50-somethings look at me and say, well, there's no answer to that, but of course there's nothing better. Is there anything better? Is there, is there, what could be better about getting older? And uh, maybe I should, any, any uh, plus 70-year-old in the room here want to say, what's one thing that occurs to you that you're better at because you're over 70? You appreciate things more. Appreciate. Does that lead to a sense of gratitude? Mm -hmm. Does that lead to a sense of kind of spiritual calm? Or I, That's a word I would use. Yeah, absolutely. You accept things. You accept things. Yeah. You get to be a patriarch or matriarch. <laughs> Yay, right. Yeah, you, get to, you, know, you kind of society kind of says, well, there you are, right? Yeah, let's, let's give them a title. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, the, ch the children have to serve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah that's right. So, so there are definitely some things that get better, and they can only happen because you're older. And when you start looking at it that way, that's where these invisible assets start to show up. And I didn't say that, I said I do these programs for 50 and 60 years old. Patricia and I will also go out to nursing homes and to continuing care uh, retirement communities. And I'll take, I'll, I'll, I'll take my attitude out there and my poems and my guitar and we'll just, but uh, it's really interesting to ask that question of those groups. And we, the, my basic message of that group is this asset-based asset piece here. Don't, don't play the midlife game. If you measure your life by midlife measures, everything is, almost everything is a negative. If you measure your life by midlife measures, of course it's a negative. What do you have to measure your life by? Elder measures. And those are the measures that aren't understood, aren't known, aren't explored. And instead, you have to go to the, uh, what, what, what I had to do is I had to find all these volumes and volumes. And the third page of your handout, Third page. Is that all, all books I mentioned in there? Yeah, that's John Schuster's favorite bibliography there, all right? And it's it's kind of a, a annotated and not in any particular order, but please know that there's lots of good books out there that that if you if, if you spend some time on it, you can find the answer to that second question all over it. You can find questions, many, many wonderful answers from people who have, like Sam Atkins, our 92-year-old decided that you know uh, it was a developmental time and and this is not just an added time to life and an added negative time to midlife too bad it is absolutely a positively de developmental stage in our lives and that's that's what I mean by asset all right so there it is you don't play the outer game anymore you don't play the midlife game you play the inner game and when you play the inner game uh, which, in a materialistic culture, an externally focused culture, it's hard to play the inner game. And I got, we, we were talking a little bit to uh, Elena when we were talking about muscle aging, you know. And our cultures used to have a spiritual muscle. We used to have a, a collective spiritual muscle. Uh, it kind of led to some bad things, uh, obviously, where people had doctrinated, they had to live doctrinaire lives, and religion would tell you what to believe and all that. But at its best, there was wonderful spiritual muscles in the culture. And then that kind of went away for a whole variety of reasons. And now each of us are on our own to figure out what our spiritual muscles are. By that I mean, you may have had great training in that from a family that had a lot of love and a lot of understanding of things that were kind of on the mysterious or transcendent side. Or how do we, how do we relate to the great web of life? Can I say that? Yeah, that's kind of a natural ecosystem, ecological way of talking about spirituality is, am I, am I tied to the way of, uh, am I uh, tied to this web of life or not? And some of you would be faith-centric, and you would have a faith that still works for you, and your family 
uh, maybe that is a heritage, and you say yes to that. That feels good. Others of you had a faith experience that didn't fit yours at all from your family. You had to say, well, and you're still sorting that out. You're still saying, what do I say yes to? Some others say no. Uh, but the society itself as a whole has said, well, we're not going to put that on you anymore. You're going to live in a multi. Uh, you, you're going to be able to figure this out for yourself, which leaves us to our own devices in terms of how do I get my spiritual muscle back when, since, I'm in a play, since I'm in a time that has no real... What, what used to be called myths or belief systems. And by myth, myth, I don't mean, uh, I mean symbolic systems. I don't mean myth like it's, it's a false, you know, it's like that. I just mean mythic systems. So all of that is the inner gain that we're all responsible for. And if you got a lot of pluses in that column when you were young, hooray for you, you've got some nice assets there. If you don't, then you have to figure out for yourself what is that about, and you have to, and you have to try to develop that. And that's where uh, we all make, we all go do our own journey. Aging is part of that spiritual journey where you have to kind of come to resolution to how am I connected to the web of life. And I'll just give you a great book. Anybody read the Pulitzer Prize winning piece of fiction yet this year uh, from 20, uh, 2018, uh, Overstory? Has anybody read Overstory? It's a piece of fiction. I highly recommend it to the scientists in here, of which there are many, because it's a lot of good science in it. And uh, it's a story about us and trees. Uh, what are we doing to the trees of the world? And it's, 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 it's very interesting characters. You'll like it for the characters, too. But I'll come back to trees in just a minute, because trees are now part of one of my spiritual practices. And I'm going to tell you about that in just a bit. I didn't know it at first. I thought I was just being weird. Now I realize, oh, there's meditative practices that include trees. And that's, that's what I'm doing. So here's that second bullet I was looking at earlier. So you play the inner game versus the outer game when you get older. It's what's going on with my interiority. That's the great, that's the great trade-off of aging. You, externally, you know you're in a decline process. Internally, your interiority, your inner matrix for understanding things becomes richer and deeper. And if you can accept that as the new scorecard, then you're going to be in better shape. The other thing is substitution and replacement. Pickleball for tennis, or whatever your substitutions are, uh, for, I used to work full time and work 60 hours a work. It's like 60 hours a week. I'm working 24 hours a week now, and I'm volunteering, and life is still sweet and good because I still find myself engaged in life. So, and I'll talk about this in just a minute. We have lots of research going on with this amazing, uh, amazing miracle, right? Um, that is uh, going to be worth studying for a long time to come. I'm going to stop here for a little Q and A. Uh, any any questions uh, that any of you have, or comments or observations, as I have put out, and like I like to tell people, I, I speak at about 100 words a minute with gusts up to 200. So, uh, so I've been gusting away up here. And any any comments, questions, observations, and silence is also good. We must have somebody out there who might be curious. So what is your, can you please explain better what is your uh, meditation practice with it has to do with the trees? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be glad to, well, I, I did kind of awesome. throw that out there, didn't yeah. I? What's my meditation practice with trees? Well, uh, Patricia and I started walking underneath the stars every night when there were stars. That's one of our meditation practices. Go out and look at, look at the heavens every night and say, ooh, this keeps us in perspective, doesn't it? Just as you as you try to understand the universe. And so that's, that was a spiritual practice first, in, uh, Elena, was understanding, uh, just looking at the stars. Um, I did the, I, I do the breathing things, the going and trying to see where I'm at somatically. So I check in somatically with, my, uh, with myself regularly. And that's all the meditative practices, somehow are slowing you down. And I'm convinced, by the way, meditative practices are trying to get that whole brain calmed down and to slow down the traffic of the thoughts. Here comes your thought, right? Oh, I'm thinking about yesterday's uh, meal. Oh, no, I'm thinking about the, you know, traffic, traffic, traffic. And so there's a deeper set of programs underneath and, and <coughs> simply breathing and meditation is there. But the third one, I'll just mention the tree thing now, I'll mention it. So I started falling in love with the forms of trees like that. And then what would happen is I'd be drawn to them somehow. I said, well, this is weird. This is, I'm, I'm an old hippie here. What am I doing now? 
I'm, I'm, I, I became an original tree hugger. Now, I've always been green. I worked at the Environmental Protection Agency for a while. But uh, then I went to Ireland, by the way. Ireland has a great love of trees, and oak trees in particular have a very mystical place, and they're religious uh, in, in their old religious systems, pre-Catholic. Pre and uh, so now I literally will, will, uh, will respect trees, and I'll, I'll, I'll do a little prayer meditation. So I'll, I'll often go up and touch them so that I am a tree hugger. I'm a tree toucher, I guess, but uh, and there's some. I act, but but when you read over story and you read that we still have 25 percent of the same DNA as trees, and then about a billion and a half years ago the evolutionary chains went different directions. But why wouldn't we have a connection somehow still encoded in our biochemical with this amazing system that still is based upon old evolutionary science? Right? So why wouldn't I have that? So I don't. I can't explain it. But that's, that's what I do now. I can just tell you that I feel better and more connected to the planet and to the earth and to life forms and to myself when I take time to do that kind of respect. And I try to, I, I, I'm going public with this, uh, so if, if this is a negative uh, for my career, uh, so be it, all right? <laughs> because now you know an original, a, a, a med, tree meditating, tree hugger type of dude. Thank you for asking. That was, that was I would have never got there probably if you would have asked. Yes, go ahead. Would you mind saying something about the relationship uh, between older people and much younger people? Because well, there's always a, a bit of tension. There, there's tension, but there's more good news than bad news, in my view. So we don't understand each other. <laughs> uh, and you guys live in a different planet than I do. So I, I, I love your planet. I have grandkids. And we have a, a grandkids in our 20s. I have one of them in their 20s already. And we have a, 40-something children. Uh, the, the great news is that intergenerational work is really creative for both the younger generations that need elders with, with a view and who have had experience, and the older people have kind of gone on their arc, and, and the people at the top of the arc, the 40-somethings, who can see out there farther, we're down here saying, tell me what you see out there. That must be pretty cool what you're looking at, because you still have a higher vantage, you have a higher vantage point than and uh, I, you have to accept that. But we have something else. We have that kernel of interiority and wisdom. So the good news is, intergen there's whole articles being written about intergenerational. If you want to, you want to have a happy elderhood, let younger people in your life is is one of the nice. And there's good that, there's good research on that one, by the way. There's some of this is not just John up here spouting, uh, spouting his his little Schusterisms, which is what I tend to do. But that that's actually research. Uh, the conflict part is real as well, but it's, uh, I, I think it gets overplayed, but yeah. Thank you for that question. One more question, then we better move on here. I'm not going to get through my multiple topics. Anything else? All right, let's keep going. Uh, let me give you some of the, the positives from the neuroscience here. That's from a, uh, some rocks that a friend of ours put on a beach in Ireland, speaking of Ireland. The neuroscience is uh, positives here. I kind of run my own experiments as a subject and object. I was telling you about that earlier with an N of one. But I'm really interested in what is it that as I read all, all these books that I can have some kind of felt sense of the same things that they're writing about. So when I read um, um, the, the, the piece from the victory piece, you know, it's not just a defeat, it's a victory. I, I kind of feel that. Like if I keep this up, there's something heroic about, about it, not just building a silly center, but there's something heroic about keeping on. And there's a difference between suffering and depression. Depression is that sense of coming down, a weight, a burden. Suffering is when you get your will together and you say, I'm going to carry this. It, it literally, the, the, the Latin words mean that. I'm going to carry this because there's something noble about it, and it's my burden to carry. And we have a whole culture that's kind of saying, well, really, uh, Tuesday night's comedy shows are better than you carrying your own burden. We can distract ourselves from our real work, and our culture is here to, to, to tell you to do that. So, so what is it that's about, about these experiments that we can keep doing? And this is what I want to tell you a little bit about what I understand. There's good research on how wisdom is a real thing coming out now. Poignancy, do you know the research on poignancy in, in older people? Poignancy is when you feel sad and happy at the same time. And guess what? Younger people back there, this is one of the things your brain is not as good at as mine. <laughs> I tear up all the time. 
doesn't mean you don't. You can still feel poignant, but we just have more regular experiences of that. So a lot of the elders I talk to say, you tear up more now than you used to. Yeah, I do. What's that about? It's bittersweet. It's this quality of the transiency of life that's going to go away, but it's so beautiful while it's here. How can I take it in? There's that great line from the old uh, spiritual, uh, uh, and you know, you would know it. Um, what's the most famous spiritual of all the time? Uh, amazing grace. I said the word. There, <laughs> I there's a line in there, I scarce can take it in. I scarce can take it in because it's, it's overwhelming. That's where I was getting at 12 today with all the interviews. I, I can scarce take in Sealy. This is too big of a place. It's too beautiful. But when you get over, over you overflow, you overflow, and the tears come out. So uh, there's absolute research on poignancy, and of course, when younger people look at poignancy, they don't know what it, the experience is. We know what the experience is. This is what poignancy is, and it's a beautiful feeling. Crystalline intelligence—that's pattern seeking and complexity. You know, it's pattern seeking. So those of you who are studying the PT world who are in here. You know, you don't have enough data points yet to be able to diagnose, but you watch somebody with 10 more years of experience than you, and they can see about three data points and say, oh, this is what I'm looking at. You need about 15 data points, but you'll say, is this what I'm looking at? That, that's just how it comes. So with, that's part of that wisdom piece that comes with having crystalline intelligence. But we're a lot slower than you are, so you are much faster on the in in uptake and intake. Congratulations to, to your capacity for that. Congratulations to the elders in the room who are willing to understand their patterns and accept the inner wisdom that you have without getting jaded. See, the pro elders can get jaded about, uh, oh, I've seen this before. You know, and instead of having an open heart, we say, I've seen, I know where this is going to lead. And we see the jadedness of the elder instead of the possibility thinking. Uh, thinner boundaries, that's usually about empathy. There's increases in empathy that happen as we get older. And, and it goes back to, by the way, this... Uh, this puppy. I'm just going to mention one other thing. Hemisphere asymmetry reduction. Have you ever heard of that? H-A-R, hemisphere asymmetry reduction, which is basically, seems like the right hemisphere turns on when you're little, left hemisphere turns on for midlife, and then we resort, and then we get back to a more balanced place uh, in, our, in our elder years. And so, again, my experience of that in my end of one, my study myself, is, oh, this is where all this, this is where the tree hugging comes from. Yeah. Be in the trees. It's a you know so, so you get the point. Less impulse to know about that. That's why criminals are younger generally because because they have too many hormones, right? They have too many hormones rushing through their system, and so you know what happens to them. All right, fun is allowed. Okay, good. I heard that. All right, so fun is allowed. Well, what fun should we do this time? Well, I think I should tell you a little song I sing. Or sing a little song for you because you're saying, John, would you sing a song? I've heard a lot of you sing. Right? And this little song is uh, one I sing in front of the elders, with, with the elders all the time, because I want them to consider the words in this song that maybe they know by heart, a lot of them do, uh, and we, a lot of us heard it, if you're, uh, maybe your parents or your parents, it might be your, might be your grandparents. Uh, Frank Sinatra recorded this, so... Fairy tales can come true, they can happen to you if you're young at heart. For it's hard you will find to be narrow of mind if you're young at heart. Go to extremes with impossible dreams. You can laugh when your dreams fall apart at the seams. And life is more exciting with each passing day. And love is either in your heart or on its way. Don't you know that it's worth every treasure on earth to be young at heart? For as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young at heart. And if you can survive to a hundred and five, think of all you'll derive out of being alive. That's called a crescendo. <laughs> and here's the best part. You'll have a head start if you are among the very young at heart. Thank you, thank you.
such great words in that song. I heard that song for the first time about five years ago, meaning I understood what it was saying. You can go to a dream <laughs> with impossible dreams and then laugh when they fall apart at the scene. So I had a big thing going on with Rice University when I was up in Houston a couple years ago. It was going, going, going. Then, of course, just as it was taking off, my boss got fired. So my dream fell apart at the seams. And Patricia and I looked at each other and went, ah, let's go on to the next one. Right? Where well, if that would have happened to me when I was it was just a little bit bone I would have been crushed by it, right? So, so that's when you, that's that freedom of the, of the elder thing. And then that great line, yeah, it's much better by far, you know, as, as rich as you are, it's much better by far to be young as possible. So elders don't mind getting older. If you're, as we decline, of course, we'll be uh, more than annoyed. We'll be, there'll be some suffering there, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. Um, but uh, the suffering might be worth it if we, uh, uh, you know, if we have that vitality. Because vitality is that the, the eternal youth that we have is not about, how many good cosmetics we buy so that we stay wrinkle free. That's not going to work. You know? the, the, the cosmetic industry wants to tell you this is the way to stay wrinkle free. And we had a, a now a 30 year old uh, niece, lovely niece. We watched her uh, buy, get her, we were, at, we were at holiday time, it was holiday time, we were opening up our holiday gifts. And she got anti aging cream at age 28. <laughs> And as we were looking, as the elders in the room were looking at that, saying, what is that? She said, well, it's never too early to start your, your practices. <laughs> Whoa! You know, so, so that industry is there to capitalize on this reflexive dread of aging. But the, but the piece is that the, the real gift of youth is the inner, it's the inner game, it's that vitality, it's the young at heart piece, not the how, how wrinkle three can be. <laughs> So that was, but that was the fun, by the way. But uh, you know, I'm going to do one more because some of you are saying, "Please do some more jokes, John." So I said, "All right, I'll be happy." I, it, you're pretty demanding, but you're okay. All right. So uh, this was uh, uh, Joan Rivers said, uh, "I have had so much plastic surgery that when I die, they're going to have a Tupperware party." <laughs> I don't plan to grow old gracefully. I plan to have facelifts until my ears meet. <laughs> that was uh, Rita at Rivers. Uh, the only reason I could take up jogging is, is so that I could hear heavy breathing again. <laughs> that was Irma Bombay. And this is for my Aunt Dorothy. Hey, Aunt Dorothy, this is for you. Uh, my, my Aunt Dorothy was always told, she was the family humorist, and so uh, she would tell this joke a lot. I told this to her about two phone calls ago before she died, and, and she, she said, are you telling my joke back to me? And then she finished it. It was beautiful. So uh, she said there was this little, remember, Iowa Farms, so, little, so this is the kind of joke she loved, by the way. So she said there was a little boy by the name of Billy, and he'd go to school, and uh, he had kind of a foul mouth, and a little little kid, you know, like fourth grader or something like that. And so the teacher would say, "Billy, you can't use that kind of language." So he's late one day, come to school, and he walks in, and she says, "Hi, Billy." He says, "Billy, what happened?" He said, "Oh, wow." He said, "Teacher, you'll never believe this. I, uh, I was walking along, and this truck came right off the road, and and, and it hit a bull right in the ass." And she said, Billy, now you got to use better language. That's wrecked him. He, she, he said, wrecked him. Hell, it killed him. <laughs> and Dorothy, there you go, girl. It still works. That was my 95-year-old. She had so many of those. And on her 90th birthday, we captured a whole bunch of them on audio and video. And I get to give this to my cousins pretty soon, so it'll be a sweet thing. But she made sure I didn't pass it out because well, there were a lot of them like that. She said, some of these aren't the right kind of stories, so I shouldn't be, I, you shouldn't tell my whole family this. <laughs> um, all right, let's do a little bit about uh, ageism and the reframes. Uh, that's that reflexive dread. RD just stands for reflexive dread. The reverse compliment you'll get, I saw it uh, today once, and it's always well-meaning. There's nothing wrong with it. I got it from a a younger gentleman in his 30s the other, uh, the other day, he said, Oh, John, you look 10 years younger than, than you are. And I thought, well, that's okay, but isn't it okay to be your age, too? You know, Can't you feel good about saying I'm 71, and I feel 71, and I'm, old, I'm an old person now, and that's okay? And, uh, because instead of being ageless, our, our culture wasn't ageless, but why not be ageful? Why not be full of your age and proud of your age? So I'd rather be ageful than ageless. 
And the, the reverse compliment is a way of saying, we so are afraid of aging that if I could tell you, you look young, younger than you are, that's about the nicest thing I could ever say to you. And I would say, that's a symptom of the problem, isn't it? In, in my mind, it's a symptom of the problem. So uh, uh, the, uh, what I would say about, let's see, what am I going to say about that? I don't even know what that is. Oh, uh, let, me, let me give you a, a beautiful little reframe. I'll, I'll only do the one on, on uh, ambulation here since this is the more, uh, see, here it is. All right. So there's lots of reframes we can, we can use for the aging process. This comes from uh, William Thomas, kind of a, uh, an MD who's kind of a radical about the aging world. But he's talking about age, about, the, about ambulation for older people. You know, a lot of older people, we, we shuffle and we do things like that. So the most common misunderstanding of old age, according to this doctor, is the one to which uh, declinists, declinists are the ones who think of the liabilities are bigger than the assets, is the idea that the body is always organs that break down in the manner of a worn out machine. He said, uh, so when you see somebody walking slowly and kind of shuffling along, you say, oh, poor guy. Can't, or poor, poor lady, she can't move. Uh, he said, but instead of seeing it that way, why not have this frame? What we see is a gradual, orderly unfolding of changes that take place over a period of decades. It is stable, coordinated, it is predictable. Changes in nerve conduction velocity evolve in parallel with changes in cardiac output. Kidney function changes are in accord with changes in the base, basal metabolic rate. He goes on to talk about Shuffling is a way to keep your feet close to the ground so you can feel bumps and not fall. And he says, basically, if you're still walking at age 90, that is an absolute triumph. It's a, and he, in his words, he says, this is not a chaotic breakdown of systems or organs. It's a symphony. It was a beautiful reframe. I love reading that to elders saying, well, shouldn't we be celebrating it now just as much as when you were, you were uh, 11 months and you took off on your first steps? Isn't that amazing that you could walk for 90-some years? So, so do it. So those are, and we do a similar. We can do a similar. Elders see time differently. You definitely see time differently, as well. It's funny that uh, in midlife you look at deadlines, and you, you, you look at deadlines because you're seeing time as goals, and you turn to work. And uh, aging people tend to see death, and we turn to life, and we appreciate the moments. And so even though we have less time than ever, we slow down. What what sense does that? <laughs> And that's okay, because we're now savoring the moments, and the midlife goals are no longer pressing us. Uh, I'm not going to read the liabilities there page piece, but there's a real wonderful piece by Florida Maxwell Scott. On how, well, I might as well. Let's do it. Do you mind if I go two minutes over? Is that all right? All right. I'm going to go two minutes. Is that? Yeah, okay, good. I got to sign this. Sorry. So let's read this beautiful piece from her about, about how, just how different. See where it says aging is tough down there? Uh, being old... I am out of step, troubled by my lack of concord, unable to understand much that I see. <clears throat> Feeling at variance with the times must be the essence of age, and it is confusing, wounded, I feel exposed, and bereft of a right matrix. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? That, remember, this is the woman who said, initiates of time, so she's a wordsmith. So we are initiates of time. But one of the things happens is, what's going on out there in the world? And you guys are yeah, looking at the younger people. What's going on that you all understand? I can't even pay it. What's the matrix that I could use internally to pick up all of it? You have to say, well, that's their matrix. I don't know. But it's still, it's still a difficult time. So it leads to the whole notion of suffering. And suffering is clearly the liability. Uh, what is suffering? Is suffering a punishment? I hope, I hope maybe your religion doesn't teach you that. But it, suffering could be, it could be a lesson. It could be a burden. It could be a... Who knows what it is? It's an undertaking. It's an ordeal. And it's obviously like the attitude that came out early in your comment, man. It's, it's what we make it, it seems to be. And can you find meaning in your suffering? So one of my favorite psychologists used to say, neuroses, neurotic behavior, habituated neural networks, we call them now instead of neuroses, because that's kind of an old term. But basically, old habits you can't get rid of and all those things. Uh, neuroses are is suffering that hasn't discovered its meaning yet. So you still keep repeating it without saying, what's underneath this? What's underneath this? What are the thoughts behind my thoughts that are driving this behavior? That it, and that it, think, just think of it, any addiction. Any addiction is a pattern. It's a, it's a suffering, but it hasn't discovered its meaning yet, so it just repeats itself on the surface level instead of going underneath, instead of saying, the reason I drink is because I'm lonely. The reason I whatever is because I'm 
this, whatever it might be, because I've got so much anger, all the rest. So suffering is, is an opportunity to learn if we take it as a learning. And that's that bearing up under and carrying your burden again, if you can do it with, with, a, with the courage that it takes. It takes a lot of courage to do this. By the way, I think aging is maybe, as I look ahead to my life, it's going to take more courage than maybe I've ever had in my life. And that's why we, I, I admire the elders who take it on, because it's a courageous act. Uh, not for sissies, was the way Betty Davis said it. So when you age, there's a couple other things here. This is my net worth. When I say my net worth, this is John Schuster looking at it. You know, there's not a lot of research on this, but I think it's okay for me to at least speculate about. You have to learn to let go. Patricia, I've mentioned as my, my emotional intelligence, she is so good at the letting go, and, and she learns how to cooperate. She knows how to cooperate with loss and sort of manage it and resist it. You don't have to love loss. But in the second half of life, third, third, fourth, fourth, whatever fraction you're in, I might be in my fifth, fifth, or sixth, sixth, you never know what your fraction is, is that uh, you have to learn to, to, to cooperate with loss and say goodbye and, and learn what that's about. Um, but this is where I think the whole, the whole thing is, and I'm going to end on this note, which is, a I've, I've talked about the web of life a little earlier. There's a great quote from Joan Chittister. I, where, where is, did you see the one that says... Uh, Preparation for whatever is next. What's, it's, it's the bottom of your first page, maybe? Or where is it? Preparation for whatever is next. Do you have that? Yeah. And then on the top of the next, then the top of the next page, thank you. So this is from Joan Chittister, who's in her 80s, a great writer. She says, twilight time, that space between here and there, between earth and eternity, when we begin to be more, here, more there than here. When the concerns of the world fade away and we begin to, begin to be concentrated somewhere else. Now, I can absolutely watch people in transition. Patricia saw it with her sister, where eventually Sandy was more on the other side, wherever that is, than she was here. And I, I, could, I watched it in my dad. As my dad was aging and he got older. older. He became more, he just, he just got very quiet. He'd look off. But I used to think, well, there's nothing going on in there. Instead, it was kind of an internal revelry, kind of a spiritual revelry. He looked out the window one day, a little teeny in his hospital room, a little, little bitty blue space, and, and, he, and he says, oh, John, look at how beautiful that is. And of course, I was too young to appreciate it at the time. I said, oh, poor dad, you know, getting, getting revved up about not much, you know. That's a little teeny, when you're a teeny bit, well, he needs a big one, you know, I was going through all that stuff. And instead, I realized, oh, that little window, that little spot of beauty is reflecting back to him in ways that it had expanded his own inner, you know, so he was in a meditative state. He was sharing that with me. It was a beautiful, beautiful moment of watching, uh, watching what that was about. So that's what I think is. My dad was at that time more on the other side than he was here, and, and that's. And by the way, again, why do I hug the trees? I mean, it's because somehow I'm in that web of life. I feel myself as I age, kind of fading back into nature. Okay, here I go. It's kind of boom. What's going to happen? Now? <laughs> you know? and, but it's better than fighting it and willing it. I did the ascent. I did the midlife thing. I had my leadership company. We did all that. Now I'm fading back. Oh, I don't know what this is like. And, uh, and I'm just trying to compare notes with people. You know, I don't have answers, but we sure can compare notes of what your aging process. The great news is everybody gets to do it their own way, don't, isn't it? Isn't that a beautiful thing? You do it your way, you do it your way, I do it my way. Let's compare notes and, and hold hands and take each other. There's Ram Das, who died just a few days ago, the great spiritual teacher. Uh, uh, he, he said, we're all walking each other home, aren't we? You know, so let's hold each other's hands and walk each other home. And then let me give you one more little poem from T.S. Eliot. You'll know this great line from T.S. Eliot. So keep up your great science here. Don't, don't cease your exploration. And his notion was, we all individually walk that path, um, that we will never, uh, en that, uh, we will never end our exploration. No, what's it? How's it go? Let me get this. Does everybody know the line I'm trying to get? We shall not cease our exploration. Oh, yeah, that's it. We shall not cease our exploration, but the end of our exploration will be when we arrive where we started and we know it for the first time. A beautiful way of saying it. The big cycle of life is done. So I am two minutes over. I think I promised that. And so there's our, uh, there's our tree back. And uh, thanks so much for having me. And I really enjoyed you. Thank you so much. UTMB Health. Working together to work wonders.